In the ending of the year, light and life to man appear, and the holy babe shall soon come here by the Virgin Mary. For the word doth becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Wherefore, let our choir today banish sorrow far away, singing her Magnificat with the Virgin Mary. For the word will soon becometh flesh in our midst by the Virgin Mary. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we always light a pink candle. For in our tradition, as you all very well know, This Sunday is always observed as a Mary Sunday, where we give special attention to the Virgin Mary, Jesus's blessed mother, and we reflect on her importance in God's plan for salvation. If we spend even a few moments reflecting upon the beautiful poetry that we read today from the Advent wreath ceremony, we will see that Mary holds a position of great honor and great importance in the liturgical tradition. For as we prayed, Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your son's mother. Help your people, O Lord, in these last days of Advent, like Mary, to ponder in our hearts the wonder of your perfect love. Indeed, if only one thing is made clear, it's that the Virgin Mary is much more than just another character in the birth narrative of Jesus. Sadly, Outside the Roman Catholic tradition, I would argue that the proper respect and appreciation of the Virgin Mother has been almost totally lost. And even more than that, in most Protestant circles, Marian doctrine has been totally repudiated as a means of distancing the evangelical church from Roman Catholic teaching. And if not that, then at the very least, such doctrine is sorely neglected as a result of institutional forgetfulness and perhaps even apathy. Dearly beloved, this is the liturgical void that we are stepping into on this fourth Sunday of Advent as stewards of the Anglican tradition. In our tradition, congregationally, we affirm Mary has having a special position within God's purpose of salvation. And this right affirmation is more than just blind loyalty to a particular tradition but rather it's an acknowledgement that the fullness of the Christian faith handed down to us through the Holy Scripture and the wisdom of the Church Universal is truly with us. And this special recognition begins with a foundational truth, Mary's position as Theotokos, literally God-bearer the mother of God. Affirmed at the Council of Ephesus, this is the church's recognition that the Virgin Mary is more than just the mother of the person, Jesus Christ, but instead she is the mother of divinity, the mother of God in human flesh. And while we do not offer prayer to Mary by invoking her directly. In our tradition, we do honor her among the saints, and we pray 
alongside her with our prayers. It is my prayer that if we remember anything from today, from this fourth week of Advent, may it be rooted in this truth. The Virgin Mary, as the mother of the Son of God, has the highest place of honor in the eternal life of God after his Son, Jesus Christ. And she so sets that foremost example of human faithfulness after Christ himself. Mary is much more than the wooden figurine in your nativity set. Now our readings from today all point to the Virgin's incredible example of faith and submission to Jesus Christ, to the Lord, these very things which God uses to bring about the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. The climax certainly resides in the gospel lesson from Luke, where we read of the Annunciation, where Mary gives her great fiat. And so much of this passage affirms the fullness and mystery of God's plan as it involves the Virgin Mother. Luke lays it out very clearly in the setup of the narrative here. Mary is favored by God as the bearer of his son, and therefore she is the vessel of him who shall fulfill all of God's Old Testament promises. So we read in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Put simply, Mary's place of honor is indeed rooted in scripture and in ancient church tradition. The angel would not tell Mary that she was favored if, in fact, she wasn't favored by God, if she wasn't all that important. And the fact that Luke, of the second generation of Christians to walk the earth, records for us in sacred scripture, it confirms that Mary's honored status existed from the church's inception, predating even the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The angel Gabriel further lays plain the Lord's plan, saying, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor from God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. We must not take these statements lightly. We are watching God begin to make a good on his promises to the faithful across all generations. Just look at the Old Testament reading from 2 Samuel, where God proclaims the Davidic covenant to his prophet Nathan. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And he goes on to say, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In Psalm 132, which is a song of God's covenant with David, <coughs> tells us the very same thing. The Lord has sworn an oath to David, 
in truth, he will not break it. A son, the fruit of your body, will I set upon your throne. God chose the line of David to be his vehicle of salvation to the nations. And while the prophecies we read here speak literally in the Old Testament of King Solomon, who would later go on to build the temple, they ultimately point to Christ and his consummation of God's plan of salvation. Now imagine the Virgin Mary, a Jewish teenage girl, and the incredible impact of hearing from an angel to start that all of God's promises, which she herself has heard of for so long, would be fulfilled in the birth of her very son, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> Mary responds then with a question, one which in fact reveals her great wisdom and faith, even at such a young age. She says, how will this be since I am a virgin? We would agree, I think, that this is a reasonable question to ask, <laughs> having been visited by an angel and given a lot of information in a short period of time. But we have to take note that this is in great contrast to Zechariah, who we read about earlier in this same chapter of Luke. Zechariah, earlier in the chapter, questions the angel out of disbelief, and he is punished with the loss of his voice. Mary, on the other hand, instead asks this question out of a place of deep trust in the Lord. Mary doesn't ask this question because she doubts its truthfulness. No, she asks precisely. She asks precisely because at that moment, she takes God at his word that she will conceive while she is still a virgin. Think about that for a moment. What incredible faith is demonstrated to the greatest, to trust the greatest of God's promises without a moment's hesitation. We, on the other hand, we struggle daily with trusting God's most basic promises of our daily provision. And yet, here we have a teenage girl taking the angel at his word, with perhaps God's greatest promise of all. To paraphrase St. Augustine, Mary believed God by faith, she conceived by faith, and was chosen by God to be the one from whom salvation would be born into the human race. Mary did the will of the Father even before she gave birth to Christ. Even more than the mother of Christ, Mary was a disciple of Christ. What an example of faith in Jesus. The Virgin Mary, again, is so much more than the figurine in our nativity. Now, with the weight of God's plan firmly in place, we reach the crescendo of the Annunciation passage, where we see this 15-year-old virgin speak perhaps the most consequential words ever uttered by a human being not named Jesus. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Saying these words, the Virgin Mary gives her fiat, her faithful assent to God's plan. In other words, 
So be it, she says. She is uttering the biggest amen in the history of salvation. If we truly affirm Jesus' divine birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension as the central creeds of our faith, then it logically follows that we honor the Virgin Mary for this saying, this great amen, the period on the end of God's sentence, promising a king upon David's throne forever. If the first Eve rejected God's call to obedience in the garden, bringing forth sin through Adam, then Mary serves as the new Eve, accepting God's call to obedience, bringing forth God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. With her amen, Mary assents to being a new tabernacle, the bearer of God's presence among men, protecting and honoring the young Jesus until he shows forth his glory. As the psalmist proclaims, Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. It is no wonder God chose this woman to be the Theotokos, foremost in her faith to her son Jesus Christ. Mary is indeed our foremost example in obedience to God and to Christ himself. As I mentioned before, it is our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church who bear witness to this beauty and significance of the Virgin Mary, with the great minds of the Catholic Church having already done the intellectual heavy lifting. And there is not much for me to say about her which has not already been said. Nonetheless, our Anglican heritage here in this congregation especially is fortunate to recognize this reality. And we graciously make room for the faithful to give special recognition to the Blessed Virgin Mary as we are doing today. With this in mind, I was recently drawn to the work of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, known also as Pope Benedict XVI, who is one of the greatest theologians of the 20th and 21st centuries, turning to him for help articulating Mary's great importance to the church as a whole. In an interview from 1984, Ratzinger captures with several points the breadth and the depth of Marian doctrine. But one point in particular stood out to me in reading this interview with particular application to us here today as we look at her example of faithfulness to Christ. Ratzinger says this, on Mary's role as a mother. Mary is figure, image, and model of the church. Beholding her, the church is shielded against the masculinized model that views it as an instrument for social political action. In Mary, as figure and archetype, the church again finds her own visage as mother and cannot degenerate into the complexity of a party, an organization, or a mere pressure group in the service of human interests. If Mary no longer finds a place in the faith of the church, the reason is obvious, Ratzinger says. They have reduced their faith to an abstraction. Hearing these wise words, from Pope Brent Benedict, we are reminded once more of the message from today's liturgy. The Virgin Mary is so much more than the figurine in your 
nativity set. Ratzinger reminds us here that Mary, more so than just a symbol, more so than just a person in the nativity story, she stands as a safeguard, as a representative for Mother Church, and in, to neglect her proper place in the story of God's plan of salvation is to do the church great harm. Mary, as mother of God and the first disciple of Christ, stands as an ultimate signpost in human history, pointing us to Christ, our Savior, as a real human being. She reminds us, being a real human mother, that God took on flesh and became an actual historical figure. That our faith in him is grounded in tangible reality and absolute truth, and not merely an idea. We remember Mary and her example today, not in competition with Christ, but rather to point us to him and to safeguard our faith in him. God's narrative and his plan for salvation is intricate and it's wonderful. And may we let it fill us with wonder and joy as we close out the season of Advent and enter into this Christmas season. As the apostle writes, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.